I had a grandfather die during COVID on, in October 2020. And attending his funeral, I think, was the saddest thing that I've ever done. It was the saddest funeral that I'd ever attended. There was no visitation. And my grandmother, who was sick with COVID at the time, she, she had to sit in the passenger seat of her car, pulled up to the graveside, about 25 feet from the casket. Couldn't talk to anyone, couldn't go near anyone. And, and to be honest with you, I regret that scene today, knowing what I know now. But watching her in her car was one of the saddest moments of my life. As she, as she peered over that mask to her husband's casket, 25 feet away that she couldn't get close to. And that was the closest she had been to him in over a week. He had fallen out of his wheelchair at home and they had rushed him to the, to the hospital and he tested positive for COVID, which killed him very quickly. And my grandmother never thought she would never see her husband again. And I'm sure in 63 years of marriage, she had envisioned his death being a lot different, their deaths being a lot different, maybe holding one another's hand as they died, experiencing that moment very different, differently. So I thought about those things as I watched my grandmother and was just really suffocating with the sadness of the moment. A lot of tragedy kind of hits you with a sharp pain and, and, and hurts. This was just kind of deep and heavy. And I stood there with my wife and my dad, my sister and her family. My granddad knew a lot of people. There should have been hundreds of people at his funeral. He impacted a lot of people's lives. And it was eight of us standing there. And my grandmother leaned her head out of the window of her car so she could hear me give a five-minute eulogy. And we kind of spoke to one another for a few minutes, and then we got in our cars and left. It was the saddest funeral that I have ever experienced, probably because it was personal, but just this scene is eerie and haunting. And like I said, even regretful in many ways. But it's not the saddest funeral that's ever happened. The saddest funeral that has ever happened was after the sinless Son of God was beaten to a bloody pulp and hung on a cross until he suffocated. And as he died, there was no family to receive his body. There was no one there to have a funeral for him. There was no song, no visitation, no sermon. Just two rabbis who pried his pierced body off of two pieces of wood and covered it in linen and took it to a cave. And we read about this funeral beginning in verse 42 of chapter 15. It says, and when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, this is the day before Saturday, the day before the Sabbath, this is when you did not work on the Sabbath, and so you prepared, you got everything in order for the next day, and this is what the people of God are doing in Jerusalem. They're getting ready for the Sabbath, and one of the things you would not do on Friday before Saturday, the Sabbath, is have any contact with the dead. This would contaminate you. But there is a man here named Joseph of Arimathea. And notice the text, verse 43 says, he is, he is a respected member of the council. And we read that, we're to remember the Sanhedrin, who this whole week has been opposed to all of Jesus' teachings. They have been plotting and scamming, how can we kill him? 
He comes as a threat to their authority and their power, and they want him dead. And Joseph of Arimathea has been a member of this council. We can assume by the next statement who himself was looking for the kingdom and what he does took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. We can assume he wasn't in line with what happened throughout the week with the Sanhedrin. Luke tells us he was a righteous man. Matthew tells us he was a very wealthy man. And we see in our text, because of his wealth, he had a tomb. He had a grave plot. And he decides he is going to take the body of Jesus and give Jesus his tomb. And notice the way it's described. He's looking for the kingdom. Joseph knows there's more to the story than what he sees. And he is looking for the kingdom, which means the rule and power of God in the world. And in light of what he does, we understand he believes in a resurrection. Now, he may not know how that's going to take place. And even in this moment, he may not know that Jesus' body will be raised. But he believes there is something more coming. And so he takes courage. This isn't a sentimental act. It's not as though he feels sorry for Jesus. He takes courage. He will literally risk his reputation with everybody who knows him, the religious. He will become unclean for the Sabbath. And even before the Roman government, it could cost him his life if he's connected to any kind of conspiracy that has to do with the body of Christ. But he takes courage And he asked for the body of Jesus. Notice verse 44, Pilate is surprised that he should hear that he is already dead. And so he summons the centurion. We, We looked a few weeks ago, the centurion who said, surely this is the son of God and watched him die. He witnessed his death. And he asked him whether he was already dead. And we know what happens here. The Romans to cause crucifixion to go quicker, they would break the femurs of the criminal. So they would get to a point where they could not push themselves up to take in breath. And so they would break their legs. And so at some point, the Jews say, we have to have Jesus' legs broken before the Sabbath. He's got to come off the cross. And when they go to break Jesus' legs, they realize he has already died and none of his bones are broken. Now we think, well, maybe it's the pain and suffering, but we know that in the plan of God at 3 p.m., the Lamb of God died as the Passover Lamb. As the Passover Lambs are being slain, Jesus dies in the plan of God. He's already dead. It was God's plan. And this shocks Pilate, and so he sends the soldier to make sure he is dead. In verse 45, and when he learned from the centurion, the soldier, that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph, the body of Jesus. And Joseph bought a linen shroud, and taking him down, he wrapped him in it. Joseph seeks to prepare the body of Jesus the best way he can before Saturday, the Sabbath there's a, there's a rush job here. He has to get him in the ground as quickly as he can. And, a, and they rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. And we know that the Jews asked for this so no one could steal the body of Jesus. And the Romans did this for Joseph as he has prepared Jesus' body and placed it in a garden cave. This would have been his family's tomb. During this time, you would would take the body and you would put it in the tomb and over time, the body would decay and eventually you would go back and get the bones and put them in another storage place. And so he prepares the body of Jesus thinking his body is going to decay. He's looking for the kingdom. He doesn't necessarily understand how all that's going to happen, but he's caring for and he's honoring the body of Jesus. And we know here Nicodemus from John chapter three is also there with him, another teacher of the day. Two rabbis who are honoring and caring for the body of Jesus. Now, why do they do this? 
The Romans would have just taken Jesus' body, put it on a trash pile, and burned it. Discarded it that way. Why does Joseph and Nicodemus take such care of Jesus' body? Well, it's the same reason my great-grandmother was buried with a can of snuff. And it's because when we look upon death, we want to believe there's more to the story. We, we, funeral home directors really love for me to preach at their funeral homes because I make them a lot of money. Because I tell them, I'm telling you today, how important the body is. We will be raised in Christ in these bodies. And that is the story of the Bible going all the way back to Genesis when another man named Joseph, his bones were taken to his home place because they believed in a resurrection. And these two rabbis, they don't understand how it's going to happen, but they are caring for the body of Jesus, believing in a resurrection, and they are declaring the hope of the gospel here. The body is not irrelevant. It will be raised All of the curse of sin will be reversed. All of it. Physical, spiritual, over all creation. And here they, by faith and out of courage, act upon their belief. Notice verse 47. Mary Magdalene, she's mentioned 12 times in the gospel. We we really don't know much about her. She was demon-possessed. She followed Jesus closely all the way to the cross. She will be the first to the tomb. But her and the mother of Hoses saw where he was laid. Now the point here is now we have the soldier, Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus. We have a centurion and we have Pilate. And now we have these women who all have seen a dead body. Jesus died. That is the curse of death upon him. Fully, finally, he died. He endured the wrath of God, but he also died physically. He's not asleep, he's dead. And then verse 1 of chapter 16, and when the Sabbath was passed, Saturday is passed, Mary Magdalene, the mother of James and Salome, they bought spices so that they may go and anoint him. Now here, they're going to take the next step in preparing the body in death, sort of a first century embalmment. As the body decayed, you would anoint it with spices and perfume to keep down the smell. And here they rush to the market to buy spices that they might anoint him. In verse 2, and very early on the first day of the week, this is Sunday. This is why we gather on Sunday and call it the Lord's Day. When the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. Now the point here is they expect to find a dead body. And we learn from the other gospel writers that there were five women who went to the tomb. And, and they're going to have sort of an embalming party amidst their sadness and pain. They're going to fellowship around the body of Christ as they anoint his body with these spices and oil. These women, the five women who go to the tomb early on Sunday, it's only these women and the angels who are described as ministering to him. Like angels, they are going to minister to the body of Christ on Sunday morning. And as they are going to the tomb, verse 3 They were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us at the entrance of the tomb? We know the Romans had taken this boulder and pushed it over on top of the cave entrance where no one could get in. And these women women understand, we can't move the stone. Hopefully there will be soldiers there. Hopefully there will be others there who can help us pry it back so we can get in and we can take care of the body of Christ. Again, they're expecting to find a dead body. And then verse 4, and looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back and it was very large. In that moment, they're thinking, the stone is 
bigger than we thought it was, but good news, it's no longer in front of the hole. We can get in. We can take care of the body of Christ. Here they still expect to walk into the tomb and find a dead body. They're talking to one another. They're preparing for the task, probably recounting what had happened over the next few day, uh, over the last few days, what John and Mary and others had seen at the tomb, and, and just recounting the horror of it. How in the world are we going to take care of this body? As we said a few weeks ago, Jesus was beaten so bad, his bones would have been visible. His organs would have been hanging out of his body. What are we going to do to help this mess? And as the sun begins to rise, they see newly settling dust and a dark hole in the ground. And they begin to wonder, what in the world is going on? Now, Matthew tells us there was an earthquake, and an angel moved the stone, and the guards that were there were knocked out with fear, and they have fled the scene. But these women, in their minds, they have to, they have to begin to process what is going on. And we see here, they don't know. They still don't know. Verse 5. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. Walking in the tomb, they, they find an angel present, a messenger from the throne room of heaven with a cosmic announcement. And as they enter the tomb, they see this, and, and they are embraced. Notice the text says they are alarmed. They are scared. These angels from the throne room of God are meant to scare us. They're not naked babies like we see on our grandmother's shelf. They are cosmic beings. And the only way you can be in the throne room of God is to be without sin and be perfect and whole. And any time a human sees an angel, they are scared. They are terrified. And why? Why? Because this angel comes with a terrifying announcement. Notice verse 6. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. Now, that is always funny to me in reading the Bible. People see angels. They're in the presence of God. They see the work of God. And it scares us. These otherworldly Authority and power invades the world in which we live in, and it's scary. And then God always says, but don't be scared. It doesn't make any sense. Unless you understand the gospel, the things that which should terrorize us the most because of Christ should not scare us. And this is what the angel says, do not be alarmed. Why? Why? What you hope to find, what is most terrorizing, what is most sad and difficult to process is that you would find a dead body. But don't be alarmed because, notice, you seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. You, you come in, this man you know, and notice he says Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus was from a real place. He was a real man. He had fingernails, he had eyelashes, he had a Galilean accent. He was a Nazarene. That's the Jesus you're looking for. And the one who was crucified, the one who suffocated on a cross, the one who was executed, lynched, the one that the crowd yelled, crucify him. Everybody turned on him. You, his followers, the only ones who are left, you seek his body, but notice he has risen. He is not here. You hope to find a dead body, but it's not here. Je notice he says Jesus is not here because his body isn't there. He now occupies that body, and it says here 
He has risen. More literally, it means he has been raised. He was crucified by others, and now he has been raised by someone else. And he's not here. See the place where they laid him. And we know there were two more angels involved in this scene who asked them, why are you seeking the living among the dead? Jesus isn't here. He has been raised. And notice they say, see the place where he laid. And we know there were grave cloths that were lying on the ground, probably stained with blood. He's not here. Now, in their minds, do they still understand what in the world is going on? Do they immediately begin to sing, up from the grave he arose? It's beginning to look a lot like Easter. In their minds, they still have no clue what's going on. And they are left to trust the testimony of the angel. There there was no GoPro in the tomb. He said, come over here, let's look at the security camera, and I'm going to show you something amazing that happened overnight. No, they have to trust the word of the messenger. They have to put together in their head what happened earlier that morning. The only evidence is that there is no evidence. It's an empty tomb. He's not there. He's not there. So they have to believe the word of the messenger, the angel who allowed them into the tomb. By the way, the angel didn't open the tomb so Jesus could get out. He's the risen king, lord, cosmic warrior. He can move the boulder. He moved, the two, he moved the stone so they could come in and see he's not there. And now they have to trust his word. In verse 7, he says, go tell his disciples and Peter. Isn't it interesting he mentions Peter? I do not know him. I do not know him. I do not know him. Go tell that man who denied me I'm back from the dead. Go tell him. Go tell him Jesus is alive and he's going to meet you in Galilee. Now think about this. In their minds, what they have to process here. Jesus would meet with his disciples for 40 days, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people and and declare to them that he's back from the dead. But in this moment, what are they thinking about? We know that Jesus had breakfast with his disciples. We know he went fishing with them. We know he had dinners. We know he hung out with them. But in this moment, what what does he mean he's he's going to meet us in Galilee? Notice, there you will see him. What you hear in this moment, you will see. Your faith will become sight just as he told you. And notice what they do, verse 8. And they went out and fled from the tomb. Now this word fled... It is the same description of the disciples when Jesus is being crucified. They flee. They betray him. They leave him. And hearing hearing the message of resurrection, what do they do? They run again. They get out of Dodge. They're still very scared. Notice, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. They are paralyzed in fear. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to think. And notice how Mark just packs all of these negative responses in here. They're all negative. They flee. They're trembling. They're paralyzed in fear. And then notice, and they said nothing to anyone. Now think about that. Go tell But it seems for a while they didn't want to tell anybody. They don't know what to say. They don't know what to do. Notice, for they were afraid. They're scared. The first mothers of Easter 
run from the tomb, shaking in fear. They didn't get up on Easter morning preparing resurrection baskets, dying eggs, tying bow ties. No, they were running for their lives. They are scared. Why? Because if they walk away from this tomb and they begin to say, he's back from the dead, he's raised, he's Lord, it will cost them their life. And they get it. And they understand it. And the five women who were there, for even women in this culture to speak these sort of conspiracies, they would be killed. And they know leaving the tomb, if they align with this message, it will cost them their life. Easter makes things really awkward. It makes things really awkward. And this is where Mark leaves us. I believe the gospel of Mark ends here. We don't have time to get into it, but I believe it ends here. And Mark leaves us in shock and awe as these women are considering the cost of Easter. Now, remember who Mark writes to. There are Christians suffering under the rule of Nero. And this is a nod to them from the very beginning to believe this message could cost you your life. And there should be some fear and trembling in embracing it. And and that's what God calls us to do, is to really come before the story of the resurrection and understand it as a scandal. If you don't understand this as scandalous, then you don't understand what we're saying. Let's, Let's move past all of the pastel smoke and mirrors today, okay? All of the Easter niceties that we're so used to. Let's push beyond that and really get at what we're trying to say. And and I want you to hear it. And I I want you to really think about what these women had to process and believe in this moment. They had to believe that a bag of mutilated bones in a tomb, dead, was empowered by the Spirit of God and came alive. That's kooky. That's weird. It sounds like some superhero Marvel comic episode. Just admit that. Let's don't stand around and act like that is normal. Let's don't sit here with our, all of our songs that we're so used to and this day of the year that, that we're so accustomed to and not really embrace how kooky this message is. We have to put these details together in our mind and, and believe that this really happened. And if you're just playing a game today, stop it. If you don't want to believe what the Word of God says happened in the tomb, you wasted your time. Hashtag thankful. Hashtag he is risen. Hashtag blessed. Hashtag Easter at Ashland. It's all stupid. If he's not back from the dead and this really happened. And you shouldn't be inconvenienced by it. You know what Paul says? He says, if Jesus isn't back from the dead, then let's eat and let's drink and let's be merry because we're wasting our time. And so go go eat the deviled eggs, go drink the sweet tea and be merry the rest of the day and don't give a rip about this. But here's the truth. If this really did happen, and there is a corpse, former corpse, at the right hand of God, it changes everything. And you can't breathe another second without it having something to do with your life. Who is this man? Who is this man? Who is this man? Who is this man? Surely he is the son of God, and now he's back from the dead? What does that mean for you? What does that mean for me? It means we take up our cross and follow him, and we give him our life. 
If he is raised from the dead, it changes everything. If he has defeated sin and death for you, you owe him your allegiance. You owe him your allegiance if you really believe this. And the Bible says this is what you were created to do, to make much of Jesus, to surrender to him as your king. And God has wired the world where you don't have any choice but to trust in Jesus. And some of you know that right now because your problems are too much for you. And you feel the weight of that and the worry and the anxiety every day. You feel you're just not enough. You don't have the ability to fix all your problems. See, we live in a culture where we like to talk about everything's hard, everything's hard, everything's hard, everything's hard. It's supposed to be hard. Why? God has ordained things to be hard so you would look to Jesus as the only one who can solve your problems. And your greatest problem is your sin. You have rebelled against him and you said, I'm going to do it my way. I will be the king. And your worst enemy is death. Death is 100, by the way. Death is undefeated. And it's coming. And until you realize that your purpose is to surrender to a risen king and serve him and give him your life, you will be miserable. And until you realize he is your only hope in sin and death and you have no choice but to trust him, you will be miserable. And as every day ticks off, one day after another, and death gets closer and closer and closer and closer, and you begin to feel that sense of precariousness, helplessness. You hear the friend from high school died. Oh, he's my age. You hear the teacher from Sunday school died. Oh, I used to think they were old. Now I'm the age they were when they taught me. I got about 20 years left. And it ticks, 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 and here comes death. It's coming for you. And you will be uneasy, and you will be scared until you understand this one is your only hope. He is your only hope in your sin. The reason Jesus didn't stay dead is because he didn't have any sin. God raised him up to say, he is the payment for your sin that I accept. And when you believe in him, your sin is taken care of. And so in your worst moments of sin, you can live guilt-free and you can have life because of what he has done for you. And as you swim in the pool of death called this cursed world, you can have hope. That is one of the most scandalous things that the gospel writers talk about is we do not mourn. We do not mourn as those who have no hope. The rest of the world gathers around caskets and they don't know. They don't know what to think about it. They turn on the news and people are dying. They don't know what to think about it. We are those who can stare death in the face and have hope, much like Joseph, who takes the body of Jesus and he didn't know what all this was going to look like as the body he held would eventually get up out of the ground. But we know, we know that the, the promise Joseph believed in was a person who came out of the hole in the ground three days later after he left him there. And the promise is you will too. Your casket will be unvaulted because he is alive and he is risen. And this is a reality we have at every funeral, every time we sit down and we hear this heart-stopping diagnosis, we have the hope, notice the hope, you will see him again just as he said. For those who believe in him, you will see him again just as he said. And those feet that were pierced will stand to welcome you home. And those hands that were pierced will reach down and wipe away every tear. You will feel the hands of Jesus on your face. The body matters. You'll feel it. 
And those eyes will look into your eyes. Eyes once matted with blood will be clear and full of love and full of delight. Because he's back from the dead. He's a former corpse. He's raised, he's ruling, and he's reigning. You will see him just as he has said. But some of us must be warned. Because some of us will see those stapled feet stand to condemn you. Some of us will see the hands that were pierced point to judgment. Those eyes will blaze upon you in fires of justice. You will see him again too. And if you decide today this is too much, this is kooky, this is weird, I can't process this, I'm pleading with you today to believe the word of God. Because it is your only hope in the saddest moments of life, even very, very sad, suffocating funerals. They they become brief moments because the saddest funeral has become untrue. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Indeed.